Good afternoon. Good morning. <clears throat> so, um, first off, I have no demos because Andrew sucked all the demo god karma out of that last presentation. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, I, I wanted to at least start off briefly by just um, thanking Remy and Julie and the Full Frontal staff. It's an absolute pleasure and privilege to be attending and actually speaking at Full Frontal. It's been a conference I've wanted to uh, be a part of for quite some time. So if you wouldn't mind, please give Remy and Julie and team a round of applause. <laughs> so I, I gave this talk uh, recently in Medellin, Colombia. And if you don't know where that is, it's south of the United States. Um, the development scene there is radically different than it is in places like the United States, Canada, the UK, majority of the EU. Um, and the difference is, is that the culture there is developing um, itself. Uh, Colombia itself is, is recovering from um, some, some troubled times uh, recently in the past 15, 20 years. But the development community is incredibly optimistic and they're very, very interested in what's next with technology. So when I gave this talk, a similar talk to mobile is not a thing, it is everything there, it was really inspiring to see people inspired by what I would call emerging technology. And in my opinion, that has uh, primarily to do with mobile. So Angus gave an awesome first talk that was technical that I actually learned a bunch of stuff from, to be totally honest. Um, and then Andrew blowing our minds with the, um, the live demos, which is, I just, I, I, that would have never happened for me. <laughs> the, the, the way he pulled that off is incredible. But this talk, uh, I hope that even though we are in a developed um, country like England, um, you walk away with this a little bit more inspired about the future of emerging technology and how that relates to mobile. But first, a little bit about myself. My name is Joe McCann. I am the director of creative technology at a creative agency in New York called Mother New York. And yes, I did make up that title. We do have uh, Mother London, which is the original mother um, creative agency. But I run uh, creative tech at Mother in New York. I'm also a managing director and partner at the Node Firm. And if you're not familiar with the Node Firm, um, we're effectively a global collective of community organizers, core committers, um, advocates, and just um, folks that really are focused on getting Node to be a first class technology solution for any developers and even in the enterprise space. And there's actually a handful of Node Firm partners here, Jan Leonard, Brian LaRue, and Remy himself. So if you want a little bit more information about what the Node Firm is, you can feel free to talk to them or to me. But um, let's get right into it with um, some serious data. <laughs> so if you ever, if you follow any pundits or analysts like I do when it comes to <coughs> discussing growth and mobile and the opportunity and smartphone market share and all this sort of stuff, it's, we've, we've sort of peaked on how many charts there are discussing how absurd the growth is with mobile. But I'm going to show you a few of those charts because it's pretty ridiculous. Um, the forecast for uh, mobile traffic as a percentage of global internet traffic is pretty astounding because when you think about global traffic, we're not thinking of just the UK, EU5, North America, et cetera. It's the entire world. Um, but what's interesting about this trend is I actually think this is really conservative. And part of this is anecdotal evidence where a client of ours at Mother is this company Target, which is kind of like a fancier Walmart, if you will, massive um, big box retailer. And I was actually out there last week um, chatting with them and their VP of digital. And he had made it clear that this year, more than half of all of their traffic will actually come from mobile devices on Cyber Monday, um, which is the day after 
whatever, Black Friday. I don't know if you guys have that in the UK. It's a phenomenon in America because they love the shop, so forgive me. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's quite compelling to me that a big box retailer, e-commerce um, provider like Target is now gonna see more than half of their traffic come from mobile devices. Whereas the previous slide showed that, that trend to be close to maybe 30%. So I think it's a bit conservative. I think mobile is actually in fact moving way, way faster than analysts and folks are forecasting. And part of that has to do with the rather obscene adoption of smartphones and tablets. So this year, um, this is, it's predicted that uh, 1.25 billion with a B uh, smartphones and tablets will actually ship worldwide. Uh, it's just a phenomenal number and I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing such incredible growth behind um, what we would consider mobile traffic. And mobile doesn't, of course, mean that you're always on the go. People will be sitting on their couch using their tablets, but we're still counting that as mobile traffic. And the just explosion with um, smartphones and tablets is something to, to not necessarily just shake off. It's pretty important. And what's more, and I think when you look at that convexity of that, that graph, a lot of it has to do with tablets themselves. And so I think in Q4 of last year, tablets actually surpassed the number of PCs that were actually um, shipped, which is just insane because tablets really haven't been around that long. And the fact that they've encroached in the PC market space that fast is rather impressive. The other thing I do want to note about tablets, though, is there is a bit of a, a myth around tablets actually replacing PCs. It's actually not true. Uh, tablets are, they are an, in fact an additive device. So I would guess if you have a, if you own a tablet in this room, you probably own a PC as well. You didn't just toss your MacBook or whatever away because you all of a sudden got, you know, an iPad. Um, which is great for us as web developers because now we have another thing to test against. Uh, we're still in the early stages of all this, though. So if you, if you noticed when, you know, that spike and even the, the tablet overtaking PC, this is so new. This is not even at infant status as far as um, where we are with smartphones and tablets and adoption. And you can see that with just looking at the total number of mobile phone subscribers worldwide and then take the set that have smartphones. It's actually a fraction. There's still significant upside for the number of people worldwide that can in fact um, transition away from their flip phone or feature phone and uh, start using a smartphone. And then if you break that down by geography, it's even a bit more um, compelling. You know, by uh, 2015, North America won't even be at a saturation point. And if you don't know what saturation point means, it's effectively when something has taken 90% of the entire addressable market. And we're not even there in 2015, according to this forecast. And other areas like Latin America aren't even halfway. So there's, there's still, again, so much opportunity to innovate and, and to explore new things with what we could be doing with mobile um, that it's, it's really exciting to me. And this doesn't include wearable technology. And if you're not familiar with the term wearables, um, maybe some of these devices will uh, enlighten you a bit. There's, of course, things like the, the Nike Fuel Band or the Fitbit. There's the Mio or Mayo. I'm not quite sure how to describe it. Um, these are incredible devices that you actually, in fact, wear. But I would actually argue that they're actually mobile devices. Um, they may not necessarily have a standard UI, but they're still actually doing things that, say, a smartphone could do. And of course, the um, epitome of geek couture, the Google Glass, it is, uh, if you've used this, it's, tr it's super nerdy, but it is incredibly, um, it's, it's incredible. It really is. It's an amazing device. And I think over time, the, uh, the industrial design behind these things will become a bit more fashionable and people will actually start to wear them. So the, the, the reason I wanted to show the wearables piece is that I feel like we actually need to redefine what we're calling mobile. Uh, I think we pigeonhole ourselves into thinking that mobile has to do with smartphones and tablets and maybe feature phones to some extent, and that's it. 
And I'd argue that that's false, that there is actually a redefinition taking place because of incredibly cheap hardware, incredibly cheap sensors, and all types of different devices that are being created. And I'll go into that a little bit later. So I think hopefully you get it. Mobile, no matter how we choose to define it, it's a pretty big deal. Um, smartphone adoption, subscriber growth, all of these types of things, these numbers are, are a bit fascinating, especially for how young this new uh, technology really is. It's not really that impressive to me, though, when we talk about what I would consider vanity metrics, things like smartphone subscriber growth and have you reached a saturation point and what's the market share for Android versus iOS, how many apps has someone actually downloaded. Those are great. I mean, we need, <laughs> we're engineers, we need metrics, clearly. Um, but that's not what's super impressive to me. What actually is more impressive to me is how mobile and its technology itself is seemingly changing everything. Right, everything, Joe, sure. Well, look, let me give you a few examples of what I mean. First and foremost, everybody's favorite industry, banking. <laughs> <clears throat> so here in the UK and, of course, the United States, we've, banks have been around for a while. Financial institutions are, are pretty solid. Well, I wouldn't call them solid. Um, they are ingrained in our life. Uh, from managing money to paychecks and all that sort of stuff. But the problem is, when you go to a place like Africa, it turns out that there aren't bank accounts. And the investment required to open banks in a place like Africa um, is not of interest to folks like Barclays or JP Morgan. It's too expensive, it's too dangerous, there's all these reasons why. So. Some really smart company, Vodafone and Safaricom, got smart and they were like, well, okay, let's think about this. There's all these people that have phones, no bank accounts. Why don't we just make phones bank accounts, right? So they rethought the financial institution model, <coughs> excuse me, and came up with this. M-Pesa, which is Swahili for mobile money. The M for mobile and Pesa is Swahili for money. And what they've done is they've taken the concept of what mobile is doing for communication and enabling people to now transact with one another and um, exchange goods and pay for things and these sorts of things. Where if you look at any sort of data from, say, the uh, World Economic Forum or the International Monetary Fund, when you start to in in introduce financial institutions in relatively poor to developing areas, it actually helps um, raise that society up even faster. So this is actually skirting the whole CapEx investment cost from, say, Barclays or JP Morgan to open banks and just repurposing stuff that's already there. And I think the latest statistic that came out is it's some astronomical number, something 70, 80 percent of, of um, folks in Africa use their mobile phones almost daily for um, mobile transactions. It's fascinating to me. Healthcare. This is always a, an interesting topic for, for mobile. Um, most people, when they think of healthcare, they think of you know, maybe a, a Fitbit or Nike fuel band or something that reminds them that they should be exercising. But there's actually something that's really cool that I'd like to introduce this company called Kinza. And Kinza is really unique because a F Nike Fuel Band or a Fitbit is primarily cost prohibitive. Certainly Google Glass is cost prohibitive. Uh, Nike Fuel Band is $200, $170 US. You're immediately Xing out a significant portion of the population. Kinza thought about this in a different way. They said, what if we created uh, a thermometer that could, you could you know, check to see if Sally or Charlie is, has a fever, but we make the thermometer for less than a dollar. What do we get out of that? Well, what you get is a massive market of people that are now monitoring and measuring the health of not only their kids, but then an aggregate of a neighborhood, or a city, or a state, or a coast, right? And so this, this data is actually piped back to a centralized server so that you can actually see, oh, well, it turns out that the mission, oddly enough, in San Francisco is not that healthy of a neighborhood. Maybe I shouldn't go down there. 
Um, this, is, this is truly empowering because I feel like there's a, a democratization of data around healthcare that it can actually impact, directly impacts people's lives. So imagine if um, you got a push notification that um, there's a flu, high flu outbreak at the elementary or primary school that you're sending your child to. to. Maybe you choose not to send them to school that day. Maybe you do, I don't know, depending on what kind of parent you are. <clears throat> Geopolitical shape-shifting. Those are some fancy words. Does anyone recognize this photo? I heard one head nod, that's good. This is in Brazil, uh, it was a few months ago, and they were pissed off because they were gonna raise um, public transportation fares, so naturally like eight million people showed up in the streets to protest that. If we could only figure out how to do that in the States. Um, this happened almost immediately and just spontaneously, and this was heavily driven through social media and mobile devices to enable this sort of thing to happen. And what's more interesting about that to me is not only the spontaneity of it, but the fact that previously, at least from a US perspective, if you wanted to have a rally or a protest, you had to get a permit and all of these different, it just seemed counterintuitive to protesting to have to get a permit to protest. Well, in addition to that, the media chooses not to cover that sort of thing, right? If it doesn't align with whatever the narrative that, say, Fox News or CNN is trying to present, they're not gonna show what's actually taking place. Whereas nowadays, that power is in our hands. So people are actually literally toppling, toppling governments and changing the way things are happening through smartphones, cameras, and uh, smartphones, the cameras on these smartphones, social media and internet connections, and just broadcasting this stuff to the world. This is Egypt arguably an unstable area currently, but there's been massive shifts that have taken place in a place like Egypt, primarily driven by social media and mobile technology. Something a little more light and fun, toys. Does anybody know this video game? No, I know no one's heard of it. Does anybody know what Star Wars is? Okay, <laughs> Remy. <laughs> Cheers, Gav. Um, so there's this, uh, th this is a, 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 it's something that just is fascinating to me for when we're talking about mobile and the physical world. Um, there's this company in New York called Bemuse. There's sort of this inventor shop. They just invent stuff. It's really uh, an interesting sort of model for an agency or product company. And they've created these things called telepods where it's actually a physical toy, an angry bird, that sits atop a platform that when you put it over the camera of your iPad or your iPhone or your Android device or tablet, it actually takes the physical object and sucks it into the game. And that GIF is by me. Just, I just wanna point that out. Um, why is this interesting? Well, for one, it's the best use of a QR code ever in history because that's how it's actually reading it. It's a magnifying glass of sorts with a microscopic t QR code that actually it reads it from the camera and sucks it into the game. Now, you can actually have your own custom angry bird that follows you around so that if you build up points or whatever, you know, power-ups, I don't know, I'm not a gamer, clearly, um, it stays with the bird. You have a uniquely identified Angry Bird that is just yours and you can play it anywhere. And you could trade it with your friends and all this sort of stuff. This thing was wildly successful. Um, they partnered with Hasbro, the toy company, and sold out in a matter of days. Uh, why is this interesting to me? Well, what it's doing is, is it's actually bridging the physical world with the digital world. And that's where one of the things, like, I see a ton of opportunity. I don't have the ideas just yet, but if this is an example of being smart and clever about how we can actually change the way kids and adults, frankly, are playing video games with physical objects being brought into the digital space through mobile, I think that's a good thing. Anyone in here drive? Okay. There's a company called Dash that has created a device and an app 
where it plugs into your car's engine, this the little dongle, and will monitor things like your miles per gallon, um, how fast you're going, are you a good driver, are you a bad driver, and we'll report this back to your phone via cloud service somewhere. This is changing the way people are actually driving now because they feel either morally irresponsible for speeding or they're using gas in an you know, in a inappropriate manner or whatever. But what's cool about it is, is now it's changing the behavior of how people are actually using their cars. And it's happening through this piece of hardware that's connected to your engine reporting back to effectively your phone via proxy. This is probably not going to change anytime soon. It'll actually probably accelerate. In 2015, half of all cars will be shipping with internet connections. That's not just in the UK or the EU or North America. That is worldwide. Half of all cars will be internet connected. So if you start to think of the types of applications that you could build for your phone communicating with the dashboard, or um, there's a company, Waze, that I'm not sure if it's popular here in the UK or not, but Waze is a social mapping application. And you have to use it on your phone, and that's arguably a bit sketchy because you're kind of looking at your phone, looking at the road, looking at your phone, looking at the road. Imagine if Waze is integrated directly into your navigation, where you no longer have a hard drive for your GPS in your car. It's actually a cloud-connected service that can update things in real time. This will change how traffic flow is handled, and especially in heavily congested areas uh, like New York and Shanghai, et cetera. I have a feeling this will radically change um, the efficiency of traffic. And this is, again, triggered by mobile devices. Transportation as a whole, with a bonus that I'll share with you in a second, is being completely uh, upended as well. There's this small company that you might have heard of called Uber that um, you can now just get a car at any point, well, as long as you're in a city that has Uber, um, on the fly. I need a car right now. Here's where I am. Here's my location. Bring me a car. And you can book a car. And within minutes, you have um, anywhere from um, a Toyota Prius to a Lincoln Town car able to come find your location, pick you up. There's no money exchanged. It's absolutely seamless experience. It's phenomenal. And by the way, Uber is running Node. Uber is, in my opinion, changing the mindsets of consumers from um, kind of need something to I need something right now. And what that means is they're changing the fulfillment model. And this is actually another interesting space of Uber is, in my opinion, going to be incredibly successful, not just because they're providing people with alternative means of transportation, but they're actually redefining fulfillment as a service. So what that means is, well, I would love to have an ice cream truck come deliver my office ice cream. Let's Uber that. I want a mariachi band to come sing us a song. Uber that. I need a helicopter to fly me to my mansion in the Hamptons. Uber that. This, these are actual things that Uber does, right? They started off as a transportation co company, and now they're abs actually able to fulfill almost anything in near real time. And last but not least, cats. That's right, cats. So I think it was last week. Last week, Uber, uh, I don't remember if it was National Cat Day or something. And by the way, I now have fulfilled my obligation for one cat slide in the presentation. Uber now has a, they have a thing where you can actually, um, it's not as gross as it sounds. You don't order kittens and then pass them along. Um, I think it's actually for getting cats that are in animal shelters and whatnot. But nonetheless, um, you can now have cats delivered to you. It's, it's quite impressive. Where you live is, uh, if you're into hardware hacking or, or any, anything about just monitoring stuff like I am, the, what you can now do in your place is, is really uh, incredible. Uh, there's a company called Nest that has created this thing um, that you see on the right <coughs> called, uh, it's a thermostat. It, it just monitors um, you know, the temperature of, of your house, et cetera. You can modify it from your phone when you're at way at work. It does all this amazing stuff. But they've now branched out into another area 
um, in the home called Protect, which is a carbon monoxide and smoke detector. Um, same set of features where you can be push notified if the air in your house is unsafe or if there's a fire, all of these types of things. And they're all being driven by um, mobile devices where you can mod monitor, modify, and, uh, and really have an understanding of what's taking place in your house at a, at a utilitarian level. But as a creative technologist, I actually think about stuff like Hue, where you can now, um, while listening to 80s music, want to turn down the lights a little low, you can do that with your iPhone and modify the RGB of the lights in your room. You can also set it, you can have settings so that when you wake up, it's this beautiful illumination. Or if you're goth, maybe you just keep it dark all the time. Um, either way, you can set it to whatever you want. So it's, it's cool, you now have the ability where Everything around us is fairly dumb in the sense that it's, okay, we flip a switch and it's on. Now things are smart and they can actually be tailored to your own experiences. And again, the, the phone in your pocket is sort of the remote control for that. And if we go a little bit deeper, we end up with our, ourselves and this concept of the quantifiable self, which is a great buzzword. Um, I mentioned the fuel band, the Fitbit, and of course the Wii Things scale that will tweet your weight to annoy the hell out of all your friends. <clears throat> this is interesting though because it's changing how people think about exercise, caloric intake, um, their health in general, and we're actually starting to, to monitor and analyze a little bit more about our day-to-day -day activities and how we can actually improve our lives. I think the biggest risk to these types of things is as I mentioned with Kinza, they're cost prohibitive. Um, the fuel band being $180, $200, something along those lines, it does leave out a, a large chunk of the market, but um, that will change over time. As we know, costs for these types of things tend to go down unless you're Apple. This might freak you out. There are digestible and implantable monitoring devices being developed today. So you don't even have to wear the Fitbit anymore. You can just swallow it. These um, implantable and digestible devices will flow through your bloodstream and start to monitor almost everything about you. And if that doesn't freak you out, I don't know what will. <laughs> I'm all for it though. Mobile itself, how we communicate on mobile is actually being completely changed by mobile itself. I'll give you an example. SMS, I don't have to explain what this is, you guys know. First form messaging, been around forever. Companies have made billions and billions of dollars off of it. Uh, you can use it for things like voting, surveys, campaigns, and of course the pinnacle of the success, spam. However, text messaging is being completely changed. And if you look at the revenues for mobile network operators, they're actually starting to decline in very developed countries like South Korea and the Netherlands where over the top messaging is actually taking place. So, who in this room has one or two of these apps? At least one. <laughs> Prove my point. Who the hell's texting anymore? No, uh, people still, of course, text message, but what these apps are are an example of innovation with technology. If I wanted to send Remy a text message from the United States a few years ago, it would have cost me like $30 or some obscene amount of money. Okay, not that much, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> So companies got smart and said, you know what? There's this whole Wi-Fi and data connection piece of smartphones. Why don't we just send messages through that? Duh, right? And so then you have companies like WhatsApp, WeChat, Line, GroupMe, Kick, et cetera, Snapchat, even all creating these over-the-top messaging apps. And it turns out that they're pretty freaking popular. This year, more than 40 billion uh, over-the-top messages will be sent. That's the forecast. I think that's um, conservative. I think it's significantly higher. Uh, and that includes, uh, that doesn't include things like photos and videos and, and, you know, with Voxer you can actually send voice messages, these types of things. So that's great. They changed messaging on a phone. Woo, big deal. No, this is where it actually gets interesting. WeChat is owned by this company Tencent in China. It's an uh, over-the-top messaging app. That's what it is. However, they've actually figured out a way of making it a payment medium. So inside your WeChat app, if you follow McDonald's, which I don't, but if you do, 
at four o'clock, they will send you a little, um, like a certificate for an afternoon green tea if you go to a McDonald's and you show them the little certificate and there's a little QR code at the bottom, they scan it, boom, now you have uh, a free green tea. This is actually taking a messaging app and turning it into a payment mechanism. That is innovative to say the least, but it gets better. Messaging on WeChat is now acting as, a, as an exclusive content distributor. What does that mean? Well, this handsome gentleman right here, if you pay him $3 a month, he will actually wake you up with sweet whispers of nothings in your ear. And I'm not making this up. He's a celebrity in China who is now able to figure out he can use WeChat as a monetization vehicle for his celebrity, uh, which is, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that, but it's actually really smart. Uh, but it's still repurposing a, a messaging app for content distribution. There's another company called Line uh, out of Japan. Uh, they have actually created, it's still an over-the-top messaging app, by the way. These are all over-the-top messaging apps. But what they're doing is they're repurposing the app to be, say, a gaming platform. So they've got all of these games that you can play inside of the Line app and play them against other people in real time, just like you would be messaging people. And they've actually been pretty successful at this. They haven't been around that long. And just recently, it was announced that they're looking at an eye-popping $10 billion valuation for an IPO. And in the second quarter of this year, they sold $132 million of virtual stickers. Virtual stickers. <laughs> I mean, I'm all about cultural relativism, but I can't believe that that's actually really a thing in Japan. It just blows my mind. But it's still, regardless if you're a capitalist or not, this is, a, this is an astounding level of success if you're measuring it by a company's valuation to be using an over-the-top messaging app. Kick, a company that started, I think, out of Canada from former BlackBerry guys, were one of the first over-the-top messaging apps. Uh, they actually have created an entire app platform, and it, uh, is, it's an SD, HTML5 SDK, so um, feel free to go nuts on that. But it's not just gaming, it's not just advertising, it's not content, it's an app. So if you want to build the Reddit app or YouTube app or your own app, you can actually bake it directly into Kick and have immediately 80 million potential users or customers. So that to me is a bit novel to think of we have a messaging app with all these users, and now we're going to open it up as an app platform. So in summation, OTT messaging itself is, is it's creating new monetization platforms. It's actually changing mobile inside mobile, which is sort of the crux of this presentation, I hope, is that mobile itself is radically changing all these different things. And over-the-top messaging is just one example of them. This is a quote from a friend and mentor of mine, this gentleman named Lou Kerner. He was the original uh, internet analyst on Wall Street. He's been a serial entrepreneur and investor for 15, 20 years. I, I had a meeting with him a, a while back, and he said something that really resonated with me because he's lived through the dot-com bubble. He's seen um, you know, loads of, of ebbs and flows when it comes to investment cycles. And he said, we are living in the most innovative and disruptive time ever. Mobile is changing everything. And mobile not just being smartphones and tablets, mobile being all of the things that I, not, not even all of them, just a set of what I've shown um, in this presentation. And I think that's actually true. If you look at how things, I mean, we had a node copter doing backflips and shooting lasers out. I mean, this is crazy that we can actually do this sort of stuff now. With JavaScript, by the way, uh, it's just fascinating to me, and I think we're living in a in truly uh, inspiring time to do a lot of really cool stuff. And so naturally, th the question then is, what's next in terms of innovation around products, services, movements, communities, et cetera, that, that, will, be, that will happen or be, that will create from next to nothing? Um, Who's going to do that? And I think that answer is, is it's going to be you. Um, you actually are empowered and have the ability now to use the technology and design skills that you have to radically impact the world. And I know that sounds a little fluffy, but I think it's true. And, and especially, I started my talk off talking about presenting it 
the, at the conference in Medellin, Colombia. And if folks in a developing country are as optimistic and inspired to be starting to change the world, whether it's another photo sharing app or whether it's to do something with healthcare, um, I think that we here in uh, the UK and the United States and the EU are, are just as poised to really start to make a massive impact. And so with that, I hope you guys are inspired to go do that. Thank you. Joe, thank you.